Hey, it's Under the Dut, and I'm Ken Hyatt. We looked at the EV powertrain, but now we can dive a little bit deeper. Shashank, we have some devices. What are these? We have a lot of toys is what we have, right? Right on. <laughs> yeah. So this is, uh, this is a battery charger, uh, and we have a motor drive. Right? And we have a couple other things that we'll talk about as we go in the discussion. These are so small. <laughs> they are. Uh, power dense is what they are, right? So this is a laptop charger. It's a 65 watt laptop charger, right? The question I have for you is, knowing this, how much power rating do you think this is rated for? Um, one kilowatt, maybe. Close, not close enough. This is a 6.6 .6 kilowatts wow. battery charger, right? So it's a thousand times more power than this guy right here. You know, with size so small, I'm thinking there's a lot of heat. Power density is, um, is really what these engineers are pushing for and thermal management is a crucial part of that, right? So if, if you think about power density, there are really two principles. One is thermal, really, really good thermal management. Mm -hmm. And the second one is high switching frequencies. Right? Okay. So that is the electronics part of things. If you think about a situation, right? So if you're driving in Arizona in really, really hot sun, right? And then think about a situation where you're driving in Siberia in really, really cold weather, right? Which we all do in <laughs> Siberia. Yes. Uh, but think about a ski trip, right? So you're going up a really steep hill and think about how much that engine, that power has to work hard. Oh, that's significant, that. yeah. Yeah, so if you think about electronics, right? The electronics like this, they are not designed for all these temperature ranges, right? So the thermal management makes sure that you're always in a safe operating temperature. The technical term for it is safe operating area. Right? Yep. And that's exactly what these people are trying to do. I'll, I'll give you an example. So this is a motor drive from a real car. And if you look at this, there are two inlets and outlets. On right, the side. little red part there. Yep. So those are actually for the coolant. So they have a 50-50 coolant and water mix that is pumped in a coolant plate right here, just between the parts, right? And all the power devices and electronics are actually lying on them so that you can get the heat out and always maintain that safe operating temperature, right? So that is the thermal management part of it. Well, that makes a lot of sense, but you did mention something that I'm not really familiar with. You mentioned switching frequencies, and not only switching frequencies, but high switching frequencies. Take a look at this board, right? So this is a, a generic power supply, SMPS, if you will, right? And if you had to guess, right, what defines the size <laughs> of this product? Well, you've got your thermal management, you've got your heat sinks, right. you've got huge capacitors and inductors. Exactly, right? So magnetics, capacitors, mm -hmm. heat sinks, and power devices essentially make up the size of a device, right? And if you had to somehow make this smaller, mm -hmm. the technique people use is going for high switching frequencies. Okay. There is a sort of an inverse relation in going high switching frequencies. Oh, okay, the sure. The component size drops. Here's an example, right? So this is another board, which is very high switching frequency, and the components are much smaller. That's exactly what techniques these people use to actually get a really nice compact design with good thermal management. So with high frequencies, why don't engineers use high switching frequencies for all their design? <laughs> That's a good question, right? So like everything in life, there are compromises, right? So um, there is limitations. There are actually physical limitations, right? So what, what, what restricts high switching frequency is the power devices themselves. That's one part of it. And then other electronics has their limitations as well. But the traditional silicon, right? MOSFET or IGBTs that we have known so, you know, so well, they have the limitations on how fast they can switch. And there is a lot of research money being pumped into this, this problem, to solving this problem. And you might have heard of new technologies coming in like gallium nitride, GAN. So we're talking more or less materials. This industry get... is changing drastically, right? To get this real high switching frequencies with silicon carbide and gallium. As a matter of fact, Tesla in its inverters uses a silicon carbide MOSFET to actually get that, right? So does Toyota. So Toyota has invested a lot of money in creating inverters based on silicon carbide to get that nice small package. So there are a lot of design challenges. Tons. Uh, so design challenges is one thing, but think about where they're coming from, right? So this unit is going to sit on a car like Tesla or a Volt for 15 years or more maybe, right? Seriously. And think about the pressure, the safety, the liability of it, right? So if this thing blows up in a car, it's not a good thing, right? So even more than designing it, I think there's a lot more that goes into testing and measurement, making sure that this unit is not gonna fail for the next 10, 20, 15 years, right? So there are a lot of design challenges and that brings in testing challenges. Right. We should get into that. Absolutely. If you have any questions or comments, please join the discussion on our social channels. We'll see you next time.
This is Ken with Under the Dive.